Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Lake and welcome to this live webinar that is being organized as part of the Teaching Virtual Work Experience powered by SpringPod. Now, whether you have just got started with the program or whether you've been doing it for a while, we really do hope that you are enjoying yourselves. And please do not forget that if you have any questions or you need any support from a member of our team, you can reach us using the green chat icon at the bottom right corner of the platform. Now, just before I introduce our guest to you today, a few housekeeping bits. This talk should last around 30 to 40 minutes. Please don't forget to use the Q&A function to ask your questions to our guests today. They would love to answer them and they are here to help you, so definitely make the most of the time you have. Now, due to the number of questions that sometimes come through, we may not be able to answer all of your questions today, so please use the upvote function. This is the little thumbs up underneath each question, and it will just mean that the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list and I will ask those questions to our guest first. If you do need to miss the webinar or leave halfway through, we've got you covered. This is being recorded and we always aim to have the recording available within around 24 hours so that you can come back and watch it on demand at any point. Now, in today's webinar, we are going to be talking about planning. And joining us to do that is Martin Holland, who is a primary teacher and head of year, th year three at Doha College. So welcome to you, Martin. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for having me back. It's always a pleasure to come and talk to you guys. Um, as, as you said, my name is Martin Holland. I work at Doha College, which is a British international school in, in Qatar in the Middle East. This is my fifth year out here now. Unbelievably, time has uh, flown. Uh, and I started my teaching career in, in England in uh, a school just outside Liverpool. Did two years there. Um, before that, I'd been uh, at university studying psychology working in a betting shop part-time, didn't really know what I was going to do and um, started volunteering in a school. Uh, and then from there, turned to, from a volunteer to a student teacher to a teacher and then a, an international teacher um, out here. Um, in my first year here, I was teaching in year five and then in year six, and now I'm teaching in year three and, and also leading our year group uh, as well as, as head of year, which has been brilliant. Really um, enjoy it every day. Uh, just, we were just chatting off there with me about the weather and and how nice the weather is here so um, yeah everything's good yeah i'm sure that was one of the uh factors but what kind of made you choose to go international <clears throat> the truth truthfully um a lot of it is to do with finance um the the salaries here in the middle east are tax-free um, which makes a big difference um one of my friends was was teaching here we trained together at university and we stayed in touch and and comparing how much I was working, you know, in, in the UK and for what I was getting paid for that. Um, and, and comparing that with him, there was a there was a clear difference. And so I decided to explore um, the idea of coming out here, apply to the same school that my friend was working at, was lucky enough to, to get the job. And uh, and here we are. What I, what I perhaps didn't realise was coming out here was the quality of the school. So I've learned so much and have grown so much as a, as a teacher being here. The facilities that we have are fantastic um you know the opportunities that, that that we get given are amazing the children are absolutely exceptional uh, and really hungry to learn so uh, all around it's been a been a fantastic experience for me lovely i mean i'm sure those who are watching if you're interested in teaching maybe think about teaching internationally sounds like it's um been a really good decision for you now this session is all about planning so let's get going with um some more information on planning what would you say are the aims and objectives when you're planning? First, the first thing I really to think about is kind of the, the big the big picture. And, and um, really what I tend to focus on first is, well, what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve and, and what is learning? And um, Paul Kirshner sort of, uh, stated that learning is a change in long term memory. Uh, so that we need that information is so important it, that we need to know what learning is. And then we also need to know that the cognitive processes that we go through for how, how to learn. Uh, our working memory is, is something that is notoriously um, finite in capacity. There's only a certain amount of information that we can store in our, in our um, short-term memory, in our working memory. And so we need to think about how we're going to get our children to transfer that information that we're teaching them into their long-term memory so that it can be stored in that, in that bigger area. Um, so we always plan from the outcome. We always plan from the end point. What I do when I'm planning my lessons is I think, well, what is it that at the end of this journey, at the end of this learning sequence, what is it that I want my children to know? And we do that first because it's then much easier for me to work backwards and think, well, what's the first step that we need to take on this journey? I'm always thinking about, well, what do they need to know? What do my children currently know? 
and then that gap in between, how am I going to get them there? And there's lots of different things that we then think about in terms of um, retrieving previous learning. So a really important part of, of learning is the fact that we forget. We forget so much of what we've been taught. Um, so we need to plan, plan in for a daily review of the work we've already already covered uh, and spaced repetition of that so that we can try and flatten the curve of forgetting and, and try and keep things fresh in, in, our, in our memory. So we always review everything that we've done. A lot of our planning then is about asking lots of questions and checking for, for student understanding. Um, what we need to know at every point of our lesson as teachers is where are these children up to right now? How much of what I've said has been learned? Because there's a big difference between what I teach and what gets learned, a huge difference. Um, sometimes as teachers, we think that everything that we say is wonderful and amazing, but actually our students maybe are thinking about what's going on at the window or what they might have for lunch. And it doesn't always get taken in. And so we need to ascertain exactly what it is that's been learned in that lesson and then what we're going to do about it next to move things forward. I mean, I think we were probably all guilty of it in school, weren't we? Having a little daydream about what you're having for lunch in the middle of your maths lesson. Yeah, yeah. Gu guilty yeah. of that as a teacher still, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, repetition definitely um, must be really important, um, you know, because it is quite a challenge to sometimes, you know. But then what would you do in those situations where, um students have different learning styles obviously everyone will have different needs how do you cater for that in a room full of students yeah it's, that that is a, a question that we wrestle with on a day-to-day lesson-to-lesson basis and it's mm -hmm. not just about um you know individuals and their learning profile generally it's one child can be different from from one lesson to the next one child can be different from one day to the next depending on how much sleep they've had something might have happened at home everybody's different and so the first thing that, that we do is obviously we prepare for for different eventualities. So we have things in place for if we get to a certain point of our lesson. So within our lessons at Dark College, we call we call our key question in the lesson a hinge point question. And basically all that means is once we get every we, we do a bit of teaching, we get every child to answer the hinge point question. And then depending on what happens in that question, our lesson will go in different directions. We have support tools in place and, and quite often for, for children who maybe haven't been able to access the learning or haven't achieved success at that point, what we tend to go to, if I'm thinking of a math lesson, we'll, we'll tend to bring resources in. So we have things like Numicon, Counters, Base 10, um, and, we, and we make those abstract concepts of like multiplication, we make them concrete for the children so they can actually physically move and see what numbers are doing when we're doing those calculations. That works well for, for our children who maybe aren't accessing the learning as well as we would like at that point. We're always aiming for everybody and, and what we believe at Dower College and, and what we, I fundamentally believe we should always, is that all children can achieve. Uh, and it's the scaffold that we put in place to help every child get there that's really, really different. Uh, I, a good analogy for this is is kind of, uh, I think about when I'm planning my lessons is, is my own journey with, with liking bananas, because I used to hate bananas. And so my journey with bananas started with I, I couldn't I couldn't actually put the banana in, in my mouth. I hated the texture, hated the taste, it was disgusting. So I had to go right back to something very, very simple that I could do. I could eat ice cream, so I had banana-flavored ice cream. From there, we progressed and I had banana-flavored ice cream with little bits of banana in. And then slowly, step by step, introducing small little steps, eventually I was able to, to eat bananas. Now we've got our other children at the other, other end who will achieve things very, very quickly. And our job then is to stretch and develop those children. And we do that through um, problem solving. We do that through open-ended questions. We do that through um, linking different bits of learning together. So what is it that you've you've already done before that we can draw in and, and use with the skill that we've got today? Can you combine different things together? Can you apply it to different contexts? Um, so that there's, there's, there's lots of different strategies. I think learning styles is something that's actually probably in the last few years been maybe... Um, come out as, as not having as strong research to support it as maybe it did in the as what we maybe first thought so this idea that a, a learner is a visual learner has maybe been debunked a little bit and actually what we need to do is expose everybody to little bits of everything um, and what we can do is there's a there's a whole body of research now on, on cognitive load uh, and and so that we we try not to overwhelm the children with too much cognitive input so that there's words on the slides there's pictures there's me talking there's too much going on uh, what we try and do is we try and make sure that what I'm doing through my voice and my teaching is supported by some visual input 
on my slides so that those two things work together and and then we dip into yeah we'll do some active learning but everybody will do it not just these people who maybe before might have been labeled as kinesthetic learners that's kind of maybe not not the approach that we're taking now it's that we're going to expose everybody to different things and, and have that variety in our teaching hmm. teachers always have such good um imagery like what you were saying about bananas you know i would never think of describing things that way but i think it makes such a difference that you can find those different ways for all of those different learners and that is what will make a really good teacher is someone who can plan a class to all abilities and um, yeah, now for sure. For sure. talking about um class plans how would you then go about formulating an actual class plan so if i if i could um just bring my screen up for a moment i've got um some some examples of um mm. the work that we've that we've done on this um and on one of my slides is it on the screen it's but uh it came up blank maybe try sharing your screen again and then we should be able to see it hopefully there we go you just can we see that now? come up yeah. in a second i think can you see that now not yet but it should come up in just a second there we go amazing so here this is this is a how i would start a lesson so um this is an example of we were we were looking at actually counting in fours in this lesson so what i needed to do with my children is activate something that they'd already been taught and they already have been taught in year two how to count in twos but counting in twos is so important for counting in fours so that information is stored in their long-term memory i need to bring that back into their working memory so we did our activation session around uh counting in twos so that we were ready to build on that in the lesson for counting on fours but quite often what we will what we will do is we'll like i said earlier we'll start from the end point so what i actually did with uh if i can just go back to a different slide um we actually started that unit of work with the questions that we wanted to end the unit with mm -hmm. So that should come up now. Um, we, so at the end of our week in maths, we will always finish with a weekly review of learning. Yeah. And so we have these nine questions. I know that at the end of the week, my children need to answer these nine questions successfully. We plan these very carefully as a team at, at, before we plan anything else. So what I want to be able to do is make sure that every step I take in my teaching process is coming towards answering these nine questions. Mm -hmm. Now, the other, the other example that I showed of counting in fours was for a, for a different topic but we still had that weekly review so once you've got that clear outcome in your mind this is what we need to be successful we can then start to plan backwards and we articulate that journey to the children as well um, and so what we do is we then share the learning journey with the children we say on day one right on day one we're going to do this on day two on day three and it's all building towards that weekly review uh, and then at the beginning of the lesson, we're then activating the different things that we need um, in order to be successful within that lesson. So we have our outcome, we then have our learning journey, and then we have the steps that we're going to be going to need to be successful. And we know that we need to plan in, in really small steps. We know that children, if they are overwhelmed with information, if we say, right, first do this, next do that, and do that, it, it's not going to work. So we, we then plan our teaching in very, very small incremental steps so that there's only a little bit of teaching then we'll go and do something uh, and it, you can think about that in a, a bit like ping pong so i'm going to do something you're going to do something it's going to come back to me i'm going to build on that and then i'm going to send it back to you and so on um and so we, we build like that uh it, it's kind of the, the way we describe it in our lessons is i will do something so i will model it i'll show you it i'll give you a worked example then we will do it together as a collective you'll either work with your partners you'll work with a group but we're doing it collectively and then you'll get the opportunity there's that extended handover for you to go and practice and practice is so fundamentally important that we need to make sure we build space and time uh, for children to practice and sometimes in the british curriculum we're a bit guilty of trying to speed through lots of different things and we don't actually give time to embed concepts deeply enough so that they are stored in that long-term memory um, which i talked about earlier hmm. how long would you say roughly it takes you to plan a class normally uh i've obviously i've got a lot quicker over the years um when i when i first started I, I think i probably tried to do too much in terms of making things 
fun and exciting and enjoyable for, for the children. And actually, one of the things that I've done more in my practice over more recent years is become more evidence informed. So actually looking mm -hmm. at what, what does the research in cognitive science say? What does the research in teaching say? And, and is there a framework out there that I can use that can really help in my planning? And there's a there's a framework that I now use that was developed by a, a guy called Rosenshine. It's, he has 10 basic principles that he he found in his his work from studying cognitive science and studying what he called master teachers. So very, very effective teachers. I mean, he's got 10 clear principles that he has. So I use those to help me with my planning. And, and, and the very simple things that speak to teachers naturally, because they are things that we do. It's, you know, one of them is review, daily review. One of them is ask questions. One of them is um, provide models and scaffold, you know, and things like that. So I use that, which is which helps me be very, very efficient now in my planning. So uh, the, the math lessons that I showed you there, a week's worth of maths might take me two hours, uh, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, yeah, but one of the great things about working in a big school like Doha College is we have six teachers and we're able to distribute that planning workload between us. So I, I will do the maths, somebody else will do the English. So my planning is is just the maths and then looking at what other people have planned and, and using their planning for everything else. So uh, it, it's definitely uh, a big part of our workload. Planning is one of the biggest things that we do, but there are ways to make it more efficient for sure. Yeah. And do you find, say you're teaching the same year group year on year, would you be able to reuse plans or do you find that you have to completely redo them or can you just adapt them depending on what's changed? I think adapt is the right word. So we would never we would never completely reuse them because the, the group of children you get from one year to the next are completely different and, yeah. and, and their needs are completely different. So everything will always need to be refined and adapted and what you've learned yourself as a teacher about what's effective from one year to the next can be very, very different. So, you know, a few years ago, there was this big idea around learning styles and now that's kind of been phased out. So some of our planning from a long time ago wouldn't necessarily be that useful today. So it, I think it's always reusing what we've already got is always a great starting point. We don't want to keep reinventing the wheel if we don't need to. We want to be efficient with our time and make sure that the things that we're doing are have high impact in the classroom, but are low effort for us. Um, so I use it as a starting point, but then we definitely adapt, um, you know, and, and meet the needs of the, that particular cohort of children. Yeah, definitely something that probably gets easier over time, though, when you yeah. have so many class plans that you've done previously, then you can bring those ideas forwards, can't you? Absolutely. It's like it's like anything, you know, when when you first learn to drive, it's the hardest thing in the world. But then as you do more and more of it, it becomes much, much easier, isn't it? So um, planning lessons is, is, is something similar to that. Mm -hmm. We've had some questions come through from the audience. I'm going to ask a few questions to you from them now. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the first one says, what is something that teachers need to do in order to make a lesson entertaining? I know you said that at the beginning you tried really hard to do this, but obviously it's something that you still want to incorporate into your classes. Yeah, for sure. I think entertaining maybe what we're trying to do is peak the ch the child's curiosity. That's that's probably what we want, what we mean by entertaining. And I think the what we try and do with that, I think naturally we are not great at thinking, but we are very very curious as you know as a species. So how do we how do we make sure that children in our class are curious? Because once we've got curiosity, people will want to find our answers, and so probably the simplest tool is making sure that you ask a great question if your lessons are led by great questions then you've got a really good chance of hooking your of hooking your learners in what we want to do when we present problems is is make sure that there is the children feel like there is a chance to get to the solution we get bored by problems and solving problems that are too easy but we get put off by trying to solve problems that we feel are too challenging. So making sure that our questions develop that curiosity, but then making sure that the problems that the children face with are challenging enough that they need to think, but not too challenging where they can't achieve success. That's where we get the real engagement in lessons because children are working to solve the problems. They've got, they maybe will experience some frustration and some challenge along the way, but they do know that eventually they are going to get there. And therefore, they will be. They will show the resilience and perseverance to do that. But then there are there are there are other things that we do. So we do have big hook lessons into our topics. Our topic is the Stone Age at the moment in Year Three. Uh, we built a giant woolly mammoth, and we had him like running that well, pushing him down the the corridor and destroying the hub, and that got the children really invested in our in our Stone Age topic. Um, so there are, there are those hook moments. 
but we know that they, they take so much effort for us that we can't do those every day. They're, they're the real rare moments. So mm-hmm. on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, it's about asking the right questions and presenting the right problems, and that will get the children engaged. Yeah. Now, speaking of that, this is a, quite a similar question, but how would you deal with students who you're just <coughs> don't engage, you're really struggling, even after putting entertainment into your classes? You, you, you've really got to unpick why. So before, before you plan any lessons, there's, there's, the lesson planning is just one part of a complex jigsaw when it comes to teaching. The, the other things, you know, you need, you need strong behavior management, but also you need, you need your environment to be, to be safe, to be warm, to be inclusive, to, to be a place where people believe that they can make mistakes, uh, that they've got the, the right mindset for learning, that people have got confidence to share. Uh, so really, you, you have to spend time unpicking why. The, I've never come across a person who doesn't want to do their best, but what their best looks like is completely different from day to day, from child to child. And, and there is always a reason why they are disengaged. Sometimes they, it's just an attention thing. So perhaps something's going on at home, they're not getting much attention. The only way they can get attention is through not engaging, through misbehavior, through things like that. Um, and so it, there's, it's, a, it's a long process. There's no, there's no quick fix to finding engagement for students who, who are disengaged. But what you do need to do is care and, and care deeply about that child and be determined to find out, well, what is it that works? And, Often, if it's if it's not a, a big issue away from from school or or within school, you know, friendship and all those different things. Um, if it is within a lesson, it, it it's basically that the the lesson is not pitched right for that child. So either it's too easy, they disengage because they're bored. Well, let's have something prepared that we can we can challenge. Or that it's too hard and they disengage because they're finding it too hard. There's there's a lot of research from from a researcher called Car- Carol Dweck on growth and fixed mindset. And fixed mindset is basically this idea that your intelligence is is fixed. The things you're good at, you're good at, and you don't really you can't change them. So you know, I, I used to have this when I was in school, where I'd walk into an art lesson and straight away I was disengaged because my identity was I can't do art. But mm-hmm. went into a P lesson with a totally different attitude, and so. You see, you know, sometimes you need to work on the on the mindset of the child and yeah. flipping it so that they can see that actually our intelligence and our abilities they are able to grow. Um, there's, there's so many different different variables, but what it's about is is putting that effort in with that child and mm-hmm. you saying, "I see you, I value you, I'm here to help you." So, what can we do to kind of to make things better? Yeah. And speaking of different groups of students, do you think that there are maybe some common um, mistakes or things that teachers maybe miss in plans when they're thinking about neurodivergent students? So, you know, students with ADHD, autism, dyslexia, those type of um, things. Uh, I don't That's think there's... one, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, it's a brilliant question. A fabulous it is. Question. Um, I don't think there's ever a time time where any teacher would would make a mistake mm-hmm. uh, delib- deliberately, but I think uh, particularly with ADHD students who who are quite busy, um, what one of the things that can quite often happen is that they will be uh, sanctioned for for behaviour far too often, and actually yeah. the, the behaviour char- that they're displaying is is not their fault. Mm-hmm. And and what you know that constant drip drip of be quiet, stop moving. It erodes their confidence. It erodes their perception of self. It erodes their identity. It erodes their love of school and love of learning. And so, um, you know, I think trying to manage those children in a positive way, catching them when they're being good, reinforcing the behaviours that you want, and 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 not picking up on those because. You know, I've been in a classroom and I've taught children with autism, I've taught children with ADHD. And if you're delivering an input and you're constantly being interrupted, it can be frustrating. And it can it's so easy to, to say to say to those children, be quiet or whatever. Um, but it, it they it's not their fault and they can't. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe maybe that. Um, and then I think just another thing that maybe teachers try and do is assume that everybody can get to the same goal in the same way. And actually Mm -hmm. what we need to do is make sure that there's individual scaffolded plans in place to support every child, not just if they've got, um, you know, a special educational need, but, you know, for all of our children, everybody's different and making sure we've got those, those correct steps in place for each child is is very, very important. Yeah, That was a a brilliant question. I'll I'll probably come up with a better answer after we, after we finish. (laughs) I thought that was a brilliant answer, actually. I think, um, 
I would guess it's something that comes with more experience. As you were saying, I'm sure as a new teacher, it's very easy just to want to switch to discipline, but that's not the right way to do it. And I'm sure you've probably found over your time of teaching that more and more you understand what they need. Yeah, and and yeah. there's so much there's so much that you can read and research and and study and 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 I think asking for help is something that that yeah. teachers don't always do very well actually. Um, even though we're, we're in big schools with with lots of other people, like-minded people teaching different classes, you, once the classroom door shuts, you can feel it can feel like quite a lonely space. And so I think being brave enough to ask for help actually, if you've got a child who's got you know, uh, a, a certain condition and you you are finding it difficult, then um, you know, asking for help is, is, is a sign of strength as well. Yeah, definitely. The next question is about um, when you're delivering a class that you've planned, how often do you find that maybe it doesn't go to plan? You know, you run over time or something. And then how would you handle this? Every, every single lesson of every single day. <laughs> uh, we, yeah, yeah it, teaching 24, 30 children, it, it's not an exact science. It never mm. is, never has been, never will be. Um, and so um, pretty much all of my lessons go off in some sort of direction that, that maybe wasn't quite part of the actual plan in the way that we wanted mm. to. That's where prep, preparing different, different things comes in and, and, and being prepared for all eventualities being prepared for the lesson not going in the way in terms of children not accessing the content in the way that you want and having some strategies in place to do that having your resources ready having uh you know ha having an understanding of what they did before so what they did in the year before so that you can go back to that if you need to and refresh and recap on that having things in place to stretch and deepen learning if children are getting things very very quickly um uh, and and you know, having the trust of, of the senior leadership and, and leadership teams as well is important because quite often we I will collapse my timetable down if our math lesson is, is going well in the morning and, and I feel like we're making real progress and I want to sustain it. I, I'm very lucky in primary that we can just then continue. You know, we've we've got the class for, for the whole day, so we can just continue that and, and, and maintain yeah. that momentum. And it's about your teacher judgment in a lesson is, do, do I want to switch to English now or do I want to maximise this time for math and, and fit things in? So it's a constant uh, juggling act and spinning the plates and making sure everything balances itself out over the course of a week. But um, in terms of uh, things going off plan, yeah, yeah, every single day. Mm -hmm. And you just, you just learn to, you know, you just learn to, to, to do it. You just learn to be adaptable and flexible. And it's yeah. something that when you first get into the career as a, as a newly qualified teacher, it, it can you can wrestle with that decision, should I or shouldn't I? And then once you've been doing that for a while, you just realise yeah. that we're basically all just winging it. So, <laughs> <laughs> But you never show it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Always in control. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question I think could work both for maybe a child that's not understanding the work or someone who's understanding it, those that you want to help progress. Do you have any resources that you think are really useful that you can give to a child um, who maybe isn't understanding the work or also maybe someone who is really understanding the work and you want to help them to build on it further? The, the best resource that, that I've come across, and again, thinking mathematically straight away, because that's the lesson that we do the most that lends itself to resources, counters. Counters mm -hmm. are amazing, amazingly versatile, uh, an amazing tool for for developing children's conceptual understanding of what numbers are and what they do we also have a more expensive resource called numicon which is fantastic and base 10 which come in like 100 squares 10 blocks and, and individual ones and for for children who who struggle with with their learning those three resources are so fantastic because all of a sudden they've got that that visual and physical uh act of, of actually okay this is these are nine tens and now i've added one ten that makes 10 tens. Well, that's the yeah. same as 100. And I can physically move those into the hundreds column. And I can see that act of regrouping and I can feel it and I can do it. Um, and, and actually those resources work for, for children who are, who are uh, accessing the learning in a, in a really positive way. And we're looking to deepen their understanding because what you can do with counters is, you know, just sh show me a different way or, or draw me. I, I like to, for our learners who are, who are need challenges, draw me a picture of that, you know, draw me a picture of what, what this looks like, because, well, there's a there's a program that, that a lot of our learners in Qatar study called QMON, and they learn through repetition and they practice the skills over and over again through their calculations. But they never really 
do anything to kind of show what their actual understanding of what they're doing. They've just learned through repetition of, of doing. Uh, and so asking asking our children out here to, to draw a picture of it, that really articulates to me, actually, this child knows exactly what processes are going on. Um, or or go, and get, go and get me something that you can, that you, you can use to show me. So uh, from a maths point of view, counters, base 10, Numicon are, are fantastic. Uh, and that's primarily where we would target our resources um, to, to help. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got time for just a few more questions. So I want to know, what do you think are maybe the top two or three qualities that are important for a teacher to have? Compassion would be the number one. Kindness and compassion for, for people, not just not just children, but for, but for people, because you, you work with, with lots of adults. I think that's the number one thing that you, that you need to have to work successfully in a, mm -hmm. in a school environment. Uh, and then I think probably resilience is, is maybe the second one. Um, you know, like I said earlier, things do go wrong quite often in a classroom. Workload can be quite tough. And, and it hurts if, if you're, you know, working really, really hard to deliver a lesson and the children don't don't get it in the way you might want in that moment it can it can hurt a little bit so um you know just being resilient enough to pick yourself up and, and go again is 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 a really crucial skill as well um and one final question what is your favorite part of being a teacher i, I think the, the, my favorite part of being a teacher is is when you're in in a class and and it goes a little bit off topic and and the children are just enjoying themselves and 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 something silly or funny happens and and you can really sort of get to know, get to know those children a bit better and and give everybody an opportunity in the day to kind of enjoy themselves and see people smile i think that's the best thing it's amazing as well when 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 concepts get grasped and you can see progress it's always a nice time of year at the end of the year to look back on on where children started the, in september and, and where they are now but um i, I think just the laughter that you get working with children on a day-to-day -day basis is, is is the highlight for me, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I can tell that you're so passionate about your job. I think it always shines through when someone really enjoys what they do. Um, I think that's probably something that's really important in teaching as well, because I always found my most inspiring teachers were the ones I could tell really wanted to be there. And they spend that time doing the class plans and you can tell when they put a lot of work into it. Um, and on that note, we are wrapping up this session, but thank you so much, Martin, for sharing your wisdom with us and sharing your passion. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. and I'm sure the students watching have really appreciated it. And thank you to everyone who sent in questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all, um, but there were some really great ones in there. Um, so just a reminder for those who are watching, please don't forget to get all your work submitted and get the programme completed by the 12th of November. Now this is to be eligible for your certificate. If you need any reminders, you can go to module one and that has all of your important dates. Good luck with the rest of your programme. Thank you again to Martin and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.